Alright, alright. So I'm going to count down from five, and then you're going to clap and cheer like you want mass on the heroes, okay? Alright. Five, four, three, two, one. Pain, 
continue to apply hot to the key. Her problems to limit the fact that this is the way the romantic comedy of them. <laughs> diagram of the diagram. Three banished fingertips and the wings of the coral color of the river to the vine and flowing from the moon. My chest is heavy, contrasting him. I cannot carry the load of my own thoughts. I loop my brain with caramel and caffeine. I sit from my enchanted receptacle with my more heavy. I have ancestors in my ears and fresh rumbling in my belly. What coffee grounds move the earth? Cherry blossoms shoot forth from my fingertips. I want words to slip out of my mouth. I don't want to lie in the dark, pressed it into my body, because my love burns stuck to the back of my teeth. Thank you. 
together. Okay. So go get your Lorraine final books when we uh, end this particular show. I should mention one of our sponsors, Rebel Salmon Media. Um, I just found out during the break between the previous show and this show that they gave us a whole bunch of stuff to give away for free. And that's out at the uh, Ted Canopy over here on Port Street. So when we finish, you can go peruse all of the delightful things that Rebel Salmon Media gave to us to pass along. So um, Rebel Salmon Media is uh, run by Johnny Habu, who is a Writing Nights alum. And so there's CDs, comic books, and even vinyl records. Titles include The Birds of Prey, P-R-A-Y, Songs to Fly South to, Arts and Craft by Johnny Nabu and DJ Meowmix, Virgin Lungs, A Retrospective, and The Depazement, I-P-O-H, Port From, as well as issues one and two of The Depazement comic book. So they looked very intriguing when I was out there last, and I hope that y'all pick some up and then buy additional things from Rebel Santa Media at a later date. All right, our next feature describes their poetry, or actually describes themselves as goddess of poetry, dualistic soul, and quiet storm poems. Please welcome Native Child!
Meeting moms having that Sunday dinner with the fam. Asking pops for his daughter standing marriage was a lengthy conversation between men. There were two parent households. Daddy settled in at home after work with money for mama to pay the bills. Technological advances have created lazy loves. Back then, it didn't go down in the beginning. Love letters were delivered by the host, hinted with a scent of Chanel No. 5, silver. <laughs> I reminisce about the time it was a crime to process x ray photos with Kodak. I'm talking before butt shots and explicit pictures. <laughs> Yeah, give me that old school love. Without the baby mama drama with the main side chick. Expletives were cleverly disguised on the radio from the FCC. Love songs that put our bodies to work, 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 work. Contain lyrics we could actually understand. <laughs> <laughs> Couples relaying the words I love you in person instead of a text message with the acronym My face was in a book. My dude wasn't concerned with some, why someone poked me. Exes didn't stalk under school names on social media. We couldn't air our dirty laundry to collect status messages or status, status messages or emoticons. Exes were kept out of the good, bad, or ugly of our relationships unless we let them into our business about that first meeting, to falling in love, getting married, or divorced. We shared information on a need to know basis because everybody don't need to know. I remember 1999. There was no cold cracking to unlock dude's cell phone. Women's intuition let me know he was cheating on me. So I used a paper map and a phone book to smoke the cheaters out of hiding. Page the squad with 313 911 304. They need to drive by to check them up. <laughs> yeah, that old school love. High school sweethearts got married, making the meaning to death the was part. Love was real. Couples prayed together, stayed together. Yeah, give me that, give me that, give me that old school loving like we used to do. Because nowadays, there's too many people. Judy, 
but this here, we met you. Some talk smack about our voluptuous girls, then go under the knife on mini Venus and Serena with silicone wheel plastic bags, real double bees, bust synthetic bubbles that don't cost a dime. Part of the Be careful cramming those triple OGs in the seeds. Someone might lose an eye or a tooth if you sneeze. Our massive community is stunning, Accentuate your assets. Baby, 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 make cute clothes, but that doesn't mean we all should squeeze it. We might avoid unflattering remarks by way to tell you that flatters our figures. We wear short shorts, which disappear in the Bermuda Triangle when the cottage cheese sticks. <laughs> Black 
tin bag for the car keys and started the ignition. It was a cool spring day, yet her cheeks stung with salt tears as the heater quietly hung. She did not wait to see her only daughter planted in the ground like some delicate flower. She didn't even know why she was crying, but this wasn't the end. This was Katie's new beginning. She pulled out of the parking lot and drove straight to the medical facility where Katie's cell was stored. Summer of 2058. Katie had always been such a beautiful child. Death still would not mar the roses in her cheeks or the jet black hue of her long locks. Angelica wiped a single tear and reached out with one delicate hand to brush her daughter's hair across her forehead, as if that would make any difference to her now. The small wooden coffin was painted a black and pink. She lay inside on a single red lining, tiny hands folded across her chest, clutching her favorite flower, a plastic daisy that used to dance in the sunlight thanks to the eastern window at her daughter's bedroom. The artificial flower would dance no more, the night sunlight once came to the cool dark earth. Unlike Katie herself, who would rise again and dance in a body yet to come, she was a child of snow white waiting one direction. As the mourners made their way outside, Angelica retrieved her keys from her pocket, entered and started her car. It was a warm summer day, and her cheeks still flushed crimson with heat, as she turned the air on full blast. She did not wait to see her daughter buried in the ground like the seeds to be sown for future harvest. She knew death wasn't the end. She knew where and when Katie would be made to grow again. This was for Katie's new beginning. She pulled out of the parking lot and drove straight to the laboratory to retrieve her reborn daughter. Autumn of 2064. Katie had always been such a beautiful child that could not destroy the sweetness of her pet countenance. Angelica's smile wrinkled the skin near her dry eyes, and she reached out with one thin hand to brush her daughter's rosy cheek, as if that would make any difference to her now. She lay in the plain cedar coffin, tiny hands folded across her chest, clutching her teddy, her favorite toy, now selected to be her sole companion during her long slumber beneath the earth. She was a tiny snow white with her beloved hair and face of her prince. However, her resurrection would be a different sort. As the mourners made their way outside, Angelica retrieved the keys from her pocket, then entered and started her car. It was a cool autumn day, so she rolled all the windows down, except for the one which stuck halfway. She did not wait to see her daughter buried in the ground again. Now that she knew Katie's death was in the end. This was her daughter's new beginning. She pulled out of the parking lot, engine pumping loudly, and drove to the factory to retrieve her retrieved daughter. Winter of 2070. Katie had always been such a beautiful child. Death had not yet more of the roses in her cheeks more than jet black hue of her long locks. Angelica wiped her streaming tears and reached out with one unsteady hand to touch her daughter's daughter's broken cheek and adjust the ribbon in her hair, as if that would make any difference to her now. She lay in the unadorned pine box, dance lining, tiny hands folded across her chest, touching her favorite book the second-hand hardcover of Grimm's Fairy Tale, her most prized collection of stories, now selected to be her eternal comfort during her long slumber of the year. She was a tiny snow white accompanied by her favorite princesses, sharing in her eternal rest below the earth kept beneath the blanket of snow. As the mourners made their way outside, Angelica stayed within the funeral home's artificial warmth to wake the evening bus. The winter's cold fit her mood better, but her thin coat did not protect her against the freezing chill of the lawn. She could not stay to see her daughter buried in the ground, not again, not when this death was truly the end. She knew her Katie would never return. She boarded the number nine, the bus that would drop her off within a block of her tiny apartment, too big now that she was alone. She went inside the small apartment, too cold now that the heat was turned off. She lay down on the bed, closed her eyes, and the freezing chill enveloped her despite her warm coats, wondered how long it would be when she saw her daughter. <laughs> License, insurance, and registration. Please. Shiny black cop cars compact the economy across city streets and highways two counties wide. Insulted vehicles by sheer numbers on an otherwise uneventful day. No holiday traffic, no special events, 
No reason apparent for the barrage of blue while burnished and new. Bright blue light spiral drivers to the edge. Let's see the day the new patrol cars arrive, begging to be burdened, needing validation. Though we have speeding tickets and arrests, my taxpayer dollars paying for each blitzing new vehicle to slow traffic, raise my insurance, and justify the expense of shiny new laptop cars. I hand over my papers with the cop in the eye and tell her, you're welcome. Radius. The radius of our supposed safety shrinks with each new news report. From North African atrocities to mass shootings in our schools, to schools like the high school in Florida, not so far from where I grew up. From where I live with my infant son, and I think, thank God we moved from Florida. Thank God we moved to Ohio, to a better place for a safer, and quiet, and peaceful life. Then the news blows away that notion of our quiet, peaceful hometown school. Schools like the one in the next school district where a seventh grader was bus, where he blew himself away in his bathroom, shattering the quiet and peaceful murmur of muttering students in its halls and classrooms. The quiet and peaceful schools in Ohio, my first thought was, thank God he didn't hurt anyone else. Surrounded by libraries burning and nearby parks and woods, woods where two teens were found blown away, murder, suicide, or suicide path, no one knows, and my first thought was who? And my second, thank God they only hurt themselves quickly followed by a search to discover their identities, a fruitless search that yielded with other details, details besides the name. The two went to my son's school, one in my son's graduating class, and happened in the quiet and peaceful field behind his friend's house, the field where we looked at animals through his time and saw these last four. No way to know what the word is, it was a neighbor, just 16 years old and a 17-year-old boy. What were they thinking? What else was blown away? How fragile the circle of our safety is. Have blown away with the full trigger of the thoughts, our thoughts, our mind blown away by each mirror tragedy, each closing, but closer closing madness. And all I can think is they went to my son's school. And they went to my son's school. Thank God they didn't murder anyone else. Thank God they didn't kill my son. Because the radius of our supposed safety keeps shrinking. The circle broke down our collective next titans and we're moving on. Closer to the mic, please. So I'm from uh, Cleveland, and uh, it was an interesting ride down here. The GPS took us to some of these towns. 
Yeah. I'm going to be exactly dressed. And I was like, luckily I was like, I don't think this is right. No. Yeah, I would have went in and dressed the book. The poet's heart is a severed head. The heart of the tree cut down. Rings of past lives exposed, loudly crashing, silently still. Roots remain planted, severed. Past days behind, deep embedded. Stump left untouched memorial. Uneasy future left to rot away, detached from the normal life. Family wormhole grounded sleep. Mornings begin, <clears throat> rough tree, trunk dog. Dirty, dirty filth, fucked up fortune spent. Free float, brain waves crash, each side. Shorelines of hazy vision blurred, lighthouse, lighthouse guides strode out disco. Feet wet, night swimming, water winds, headspace scrambled egg, runny nose. <clears throat> Foggy mountain pass where our hearts died, searching, searching clues, searching clues to grow up again, reincarnation of the lover's wicked souls, our childhood picked before it was ripe. Leaving our branches exposed to the winter, scars covered by barren arms empty, embracing ungodly venom of youth. Falling for guitar songs and library girls, quenching fruitless thirst with, <clears throat> with word Calling for gutter songs and library girls, crunching fruitless thirst with, with burnt ghosts. Transient city jumpers, Macy's Day, <coughs> Macy's Day balloon floated, coastal crusaders seeking new eyes and ears. Our severed spines grow stronger now. Fluids pump disembodied into ink pens. Writing machines control breathing. Click, 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 clack, 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 ping, zip. <clears throat> Reams of discarded paper trails vaporized, dripping damp with hysterical tears. Depression tortured scribes weep for days, creating the volumes of immortalized pain. It inspires future novelists to avoid poetry, detouring the, the confident bullies of <clears throat> Touring the confident boys of reasonless, carving up the long standing grammatical rules, spirit guiding lost boys and lovely girls. <clears throat> For no one deserves this path that's laid out. It's up to the ghostwriters to haunt, sneaking into the bookshelves, bare of truth, sipping legless in the church pews, buying, burying themselves behind humans, gracefully inside the folds of offering envelopes, black market rewriting prayer cards humorously, tearing the hard particles out of the vocabulary. As night stab apart the fabrics of relationships, typing frantically, painfully unemployed, masturbating away the fantasies of picket fences, just mind-fucking the neighbor's wife, forgetting to physically love anyone, soaking the sweatbox cigarette desktop, ashes pile like reminders of old friends, boxing up old photos that no longer inspire, quaking bellies flick with the broken tops, burning, burning up hopelessness of adulthood, visiting the vineyards in search of synonyms, finding Finding only empty graves unreserved. Headstones where your tree stuff stood. Removed to make room for the hard workers. 
So you scrap, so you scrape home bloody, bloody bark from me, leaving trails of wooden dreams behind. Your eyes downward watch the road. Looking for your past on, <clears throat> on feet to step, only finding your nose in troubled strays. In beds that wake, in beds that wake the ghouls of steps, an entire prelude to madness. Scripted, scripted by beatniks and punk rockers, slideshow peepers hand, hand fucking themselves. Listening to punk records and skipping needles. This floating head is our poetry mantra. This tree laying silent chorus our God. For we are alone amongst the millions. The men who wrote, the, the ones who wrote uncaring to self. Unimpressed debtors, prisons, escapees. Hiding in the basements of mausoleums of words. Where are the voices of the dead dreams? Like the bells in the burnt out churches, forgotten until desired and cast away. This is the writer's life encapsulated. We are discarded kids of workers, the lost champions of wordplay. Poet, the least gambled upon scribble, vomiting sentences from floating premiums, doubting themselves in the early graves, sick with every mental sickness driven, nails hammered into addicted hands, yellowing fingers burned to their filters. Dead weather deviants go on randomly, produce the next unread masterpiece. Editors shake off the dust covered light, sinking back into the dead pool paragraph, off subject, off time, perfection, cadence crippled by preformed jazz. Words sever our heads, brain leaves, slipped into vast undiscovered talent. Someday, any day, fuck it all away. This pen is a breathing tube of life, the one to bury <clears throat> in the suit coat. So when the ghost call comes, I'll begin to finish the great American novel, unleashing it from a gravestone curse. Beware of the undead poet force, the worst nightmare of literary lore. For we writers have, <clears throat> we writers have lived half dead, exciting to the onlookers, but never quite satisfied. Our garments vintage poor, like old shoe socks. Radio, fever dream, traveling alone. There's such great truth in our lives. Believe us when we, when you can't or won't. The words won't come. The words won't cease seeping leak. We are the injured, but the bandage in paper. Scratch into time, eternal drifting. Lay on a quiet, lay quiet beneath the canopy, clandestinely sculpting new worlds, producing vulgar gospels in our blood. The poet's heart is a severed head, the heart is a true puppet. These coke nose records slip, hop cherry splattered polish, dreadlock rodeo beer snobs, sipping on tired trends weekly. Fixed gear water park hot box, pork leather striped fuck box, blasted off the snot rocket zoom, drug hug, weak arm, jumpy love. Sleeping dirty mattress magic, frame dark gallery, coke poison, Basquiat's hot buttered knife fight. Pencil top tipsy <clears throat> Trump wrestler. Cappy mama tooth smiling. Black mama snake bite turnstile. Smoky howling Ginsburg lettuce. Rotting root canal street fear flood. Baby gives hand slap kisses. Sleeping later unemployed creative. Stopping the paper chase cheese wheel. We, <clears throat> we will all die for our hearts. Thank you.